everyone. Welcome to our roundtable uh, discussion this morning. Um, uh, we are in uh, Pembroke's old library, uh, which uh, the original uh, structure of which dates back to the late 14th century. So 650 years of, uh, of history have uh, passed in the uh, lifetime of this room. And um, uh, the uh, crisis we are now facing with climate change is probably the most challenging thing that uh, we have experienced in the whole of those 650 years. Uh, what we do about that, how we go about doing it, uh, is uh, the theme that we are going to be discussing this morning. Uh, now, uh, uh, we are very honoured to have with us uh, Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, former Prime Minister of Portugal, and most importantly, the most recent graduate of Cambridge University, um, uh, having received an honorary degree uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, Lord Rowan Williams, uh, former Archbishop of Canterbury, um, uh, Anjam Nahar, uh, who is president of uh, the Cambridge Graduate uh, Students' Union. Mariam Grassley, who is a, a second-year geography student uh, here at Pembroke. And uh, Professor Richard Sennett, uh, very distinguished uh, sociologist uh, from uh, New York University, LSE, Columbia, and Cambridge. <laughs> um, uh, so... We, we have a, a lot of wisdom and energy and uh, enthusiasm on the panel. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to open the discussion with uh, four or five minutes of, uh, uh, of, um, uh, of, of wisdom. Uh, we'll then have a bit of discussion amongst the panel, and then we will throw things open to uh, um, uh, questions from the floor, um, uh, we have uh, James and Sophia with microphones ready to uh, um, uh, come and uh, help you if uh, uh, you want to ask a question. And we are also being live streamed um, uh, across the college, university and UN networks. So there will be, I'm sure, questions coming in online as well. And I will try and ask those on behalf of those who are viewing uh, uh, remotely uh, when we get to them. But uh, without further ado, uh, the ethics of climate change, how we go about tackling this enormous problem. Um, can I ask Antonio if you will go first? Well, first of all, thank you very much. It's for me an enormous pleasure to be in Pembroke College, and I'm extremely grateful for the generosity with which uh, I was yesterday distinguished by your uh, honorary doctorship, and I want to really express uh, my enormous gratitude, but always to tell you that I was very happy with uh, this gesture, because it's great to be honorary doctor of uh, uh, such a fantastic institution. Now, do you know how many years ago it was discovered the principle that uh, CO2 uh, in the atmosphere would affect temperature? 165 years ago, Alice Foot discovered it, which means we had 165 years to make it normal to avoid the problems of climate change, uh, not to be addicted to fossil fuels, uh, to have more, uh, uh, I would say, uh, healthy uh, uh, habits in our lives, uh, and to organize our societies in a way that would be compatible with uh, uh, peace and harmony with nature. But we spoil everything because we completely forgot during these 165 years to do everything that was necessary to avoid climate change. But we had time. And of course in the beginning that was not the problem, but my generation is indeed responsible for the fact 
that with a clear conscience since uh, decades that the problem would come and would come with the intensity it's coming, we really didn't do it. Now, the first ethical question is an intergenerational question. I mean, things are organized in our political uh, and economic uh, uh, mechanisms for the interests of the future and the interests of future generations to be sacrificed to present interests. For instance, uh, in an economic calculus, uh, if you ask for the value of something that will be received in 20 years, the present value, that value is discounted. Uh, so it's the interest rates functioning the other way around. Which means that in all the construction of our economy, there is this idea that the future has less value. Which means that our mentality has been developing in a way in which future generations are neglected in relation to our present interests. And this is, of course, a huge ethical problem. Then countries know that, and other actors know, that climate change is a threat and that people should reduce emissions. And we enter into the so-called tragedy of the commons, in which each country understands and believes that the world must reduce emissions, but the country itself goes on increasing its emissions. And this is another ethical problem that we still face today in relation to many. I mean, many are behaving well, probably too late, but <coughs> or late, but well, but others uh, are still uh, responsible for this tragedy of the commons. Then we have, of course, an ethical problem with biodiversity, with the other species. Uh, uh, we are uh, sacrificing species at a speed that is uh, unimaginable. One million species is at risk today, and all this is linked to climate change. There is a perfect connection between climate change and biodiversity, as, uh, as you all know. Uh, and then we have a serious ethical problem in relation to the world of today. Those that have more contributed to climate change are not those that are suffering the biggest impacts, the developed world versus small island development states or countries in Africa that are being devastated by drought and uh, desertification. And uh, there was not the conscience that this injustice should be repaired by uh, overwhelming support from the polluters to the victims of pollution. And indeed, uh, until now, there has been very little financial support to developing countries for them to be able to adapt their societies, their communities, to make them resilient, uh, to limit the impacts of climate change. And, and two of the serious problems that we are discussing in Glasgow, but we are not yet there, is that the developed countries were not able, until now, to meet the commitment they made in Paris, and they had already made uh, 10 years before, that they would give 100 billion US dollars to developing countries in, for climate action. And even now, the last proposal is, we didn't do it in 2020, 2021, 20, we will probably not do it in 2022, but we will do it in 2023, and then we'll compensate. And as you can imagine, the developing countries do not like to hear these. And then there has been reluctance in many to understand that this money needs to be given not only for these countries to reduce their emissions, but also for adaptation, to limit the dramatic impacts that are already existing. Now, imagine a country in Africa. That country has no vaccines. That country has not received significant amount of resources in relation to the recovery. Developed countries are spending about 28% of their GDP in the recovering of their economies. Least developed countries, only 2%, of a much smaller GDP. The liquidity and the debt problems that they have have not been solved. Uh, 
And so they are victims of lack of vaccines, victims of lack of financial resources for recovery, and victims of climate. So there is a basic global injustice, there is a basic global inequality that is a very serious ethical problem of our societies and especially of all of us that live in the developed world. So responsibility towards future generations, I hope it will be in the center of the reforms we are now trying to introduce in the United Nations. Responsibility towards nature and towards uh, uh, other uh, the, the biodiversity, uh, making peace with nature. Uh, responsibility uh, in relation to correcting the dramatic injustices that are now taking place due to climate change between developed and developing countries, between men and women. Women are suffering much more than men, the impacts of climate change and uh, other uh, uh, levels of inequality that we know in the world. So climate change is indeed a serious ethical problem. And uh, allow me to pay tribute to Cambridge again because uh, when confronted with the idea that the interests of future generations were less relevant than the present interests, uh, Frank Ramsey said the idea that future generations count for less is ethically indefensible and arises merely from a weakness of the imagination. Mm -hmm. So Cambridge, once again, has the key to all the ethical problems that we are discussing. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Antonio. Rowan. It's a very great honor to be invited to speak in this company, and I'm delighted to have the chance to do so. I'm also delighted at the quote from Frank Ramsey, who, as many of you will not know, was the brother of one of my predecessors as Archbishop of Canterbury as well as being probably the most distinguished mathematical philosopher of the 20th century. But I'd want to follow on one of the points that the Secretary General has already made so eloquently and supplement it with two reflections of my own. We've heard about the ethics of looking for the interest of future generations. If we were to take seriously what seems to be the assumption on which we presently work, we would not bother with education. As a human race, as a civilized human race, we are deeply invested in educating the next generation. We believe that we have something of value into which we want to induct a rising generation. In other words, in part of our social imaginary, we take seriously the reality of the next generation. We believe we have something to share. What a paradox, therefore, what a tragic irony that in our international affairs and our economic affairs, we behave as if our commitment to education were empty, as if the rising generation had nothing which could be shared with us. The fact is, there are no cut-off points between generations. We are always overlapping generations. And so our duty is not just about the future, it's about the present. And it's about recognizing the deep immoral inconsistency in pretending that we are committed to educating the next generation while actually taking away from them the possibility of a proper active and life-giving share in the culture we treasure. Hence the importance, and I hope to hear more in the UN, at the COP conference, at many other Fora, I hope to hear more about the importance of legislation around future generations. I declare an interest, I'm Welsh, and the government of Wales a few years ago passed a Future Generations Act, which requires that every piece of Welsh legislation be scrutinized in terms of its impact on future generations. A similar piece of legislation has been introduced by Lord Byrd in the House of Lords, I believe. And that, I think, is something which all governments should be considering with the greatest of urgency. Second point, I've already said that 
the issue about climate change is not an issue about the future, it's an issue about the present. We've heard from the Secretary General something of the dire situation of less advantaged countries who, in the wake of the pandemic, are still more disadvantaged, who look to the promises made by more prosperous and more developed societies and are disappointed when they look. We have not honored our commitments. We are, we are perpetuating not a future injustice, but a present and tangible injustice. But one particular instance of that present and tangible injustice, which I'd want to underline because it doesn't have enough profile, is the way in which activists and protesters around climate issues are deeply vulnerable to murderous violence. A couple of weeks ago, I was part of a seminar which involved the commemoration of an activist in South Africa shot in her home by unnamed and so far unidentified agents after her protests about the development of her region by a mining company. This is one story among scores of stories of climate activists around the world being subject not only to threat, but to actual murder. That is a present, tangible, ethical issue. And a culture of impunity surrounding such crimes is one of the worst things in our current global scene. So a present issue for all the reasons we've heard about, but also very specifically for those who have the courage to step forward and protest non-violently against exploitation. Very often, these are people who come from themselves, who come from impoverished and frequently indigenous communities already marginal in their own countries. Third and final point, which is a rather more general ethical point. It builds on that sense of moral crisis around our global habits, because the attitude which regards the world around us as our property to be disposed of as we will is an attitude that carries over very readily into seeing the rest of the human race as potentially property. We like to think we've grown beyond slavery. We haven't. There is a real crossover between making the world our property to do with as we will and making the rest of the human race our property to be exploited and wrecked by our own agenda. So the big moral question is, can we unclench our fists? Can we challenge that fundamental, I'll use the word because I'm a priest, sin, that fundamental sin of regarding our environment, human and non-human, as something to be possessed? Already in Hebrew scripture, we read that the land given to God's people in Hebrew scripture is not a property, but a loan. It's there to be used and it's there to be shared. That deep moral and religious principle is, to put it mildly, occluded in global priorities at the moment, and it's time it wasn't. So legislation for future generations, recognition that this is an immediate, present ethical problem, exploration of and challenge to that basic proprietorial attitude to the world around us and the people around us. With all those in mind, perhaps change will be possible because it had better be for all our sakes. Thank you. Um, now, the rising generation. Um, and Jan. Thank you, Chris. Um, Actually, I'd like to start by saying thank you to Antonio for being with us in Cambridge today and having journeyed from Glasgow and to Pembroke for hosting such an important discussion. I am going to talk about two things today. International solidarity, which follows on really nicely from the first two speeches, but also the strategy of divestment, which grounds the conversation really nicely in the Cambridge context. So... I did my research master's at Mary Edwards College down the road, finishing in July, and I wrote about the alarming and grave consequences of oil extraction in the Niger Delta, um, and how 
this has destroyed landscapes and livelihoods, led to serious biodiversity loss and seriously affected the health of the local populations. As part of, because I was as an English student, so as part of my research, I read works by Chinua Chebe, Ben Okri, Helen Habila, Wallace Inka. But there was one writer that undeniably inspired me more than the others, and that was Ken Sarawiwa, whose works I hold really dear to my heart. And what motivates me and inspires me is Ken Sarawiwa's relentless activism and consistently international approach to dealing with this very specific localized issues faced by his Ogoni people. And because of Sarawiwa, I've come to view environmental degradation as a form of violence, and a violence that can happen on very fast scales. So in the Niger Delta, oil spills and gas flares, which are spectacular. But also, it's important to remember that this violence can be slow violence as well, as theorist Rob Nixon has termed it. So we see the, the gradual erosion of our coastlines and the slow melting of our glaciers and the, the gradual pollution of our bodies of water. My own climate campaigning started when I was an undergraduate at a different university, at the University of Bristol, where I was part of a student group that successfully lobbied the university to divest from the fossil fuel industry. Divestment being a mechanism which ensures that an institution cuts all financial ties with an unethical industry. I then arrived in Cambridge last summer during a period of intense discussion regarding Cambridge University's need to divest. In that summer, a senior research associate at Jesus College, also down the road, uh, published an amazing report outlining all of the details of what divestment at Cambridge would look like. Following the publication of that report, the university made the big decision to commit to divestment by 2030. This decision makes me extremely proud to be a member of the Cambridge community and also to be a trustee of the university. And um, I was laughing with Richard earlier because uh, uh, we did it before Harvard, who only managed it this September. It's not <laughs> <As> a race. <laughs> well, we need to create some urgency, so. <laughs> um, uh, divestment ensures that money can be allocated to renewable energy and to, to green bonds. It, sends a message to unethical companies that institutions will not work with them until they radically change their approaches and their practices. Divestment can be done without violence or without certain forms of disruption, and it can create working relationships and lines of communication between the student community and senior management in the university. Divestment is the right thing to do. And by divesting, the University of Cambridge has sent a message to the world that it takes the climate catastrophe that we are in now seriously. But given the severity of the situation we face, there is still more that Cambridge University can do. Now is the time for Cambridge to commit to net zero by 2030 and to review its acceptance of research and donations from the worst hu human rights and climate offenders. As Cambridge students, we're not going to stop campaigning until keystone species stop going extinct, until the sea levels stop rising, and until people across the global south are guaranteed safety. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mariam. Yeah, um, thank you for inviting me to the panel and I'm really grateful to have such amazing speakers with us here. Um, I'm Mariam, a second year geography student here and I spend a lot of my degree and my free time learning about climate change and climate justice. And I try to act on what I've learned. I'm part of Extinction Rebellion Youth Cambridge, which hopefully you've heard about in the news. Uh, we try to raise awareness, 
do mass protests to change policy, do more direct action for specific companies, and also trying to create some of the solutions on the ground. I'm also part of FLAME, which is the Youth Land Workers Alliance, and we're trying to fight for sustainable agriculture and trying to get more young people into farming. And there's always other activist stuff going on, like helping out with the divestment campaign, giving lessons at schools, making leaflets, it's an endless saga, <laughs> it's great. Um, I just want to say now I can only speak from my own opinions and experiences. I have listened and engaged with a lot of other young people and activists, but I can't, comp can't claim to be representative of all of them. Today, I'm going to talk about two main injustices within the climate crisis and some power imbalances, and then talk about representing voices and community resilience. So for me, there are two main injustices within the climate crisis. The first is the one Antonio mentioned already, that those emitting the most greenhouse gases are, and those who have emitted the most greenhouse gases historically are not the people who are most affected by the climate crisis. Um, and that's why we shout on the streets that climate justice is social justice, because it's always minority groups who are already vulnerable that will be impacted more. So you first have to bring those groups up in order to have climate resilience. The second big injustice is that those in power are not those who are being impacted. COP26 has the, got so many more voices than it has done before, and I was really happy to see that indigenous peoples have finally got representation, but there's still a long way to go. It's a great step that they've got governments from around the world, but you need to make sure that those governments are representative of their populations. There are still lots of voices that are being ignored in our communities. Um, I would argue we need citizens' assemblies and we need more power given to local communities. And we don't need systemic upheaval. We don't need a revolution for that to happen. We already have the structures in place. We've had citizens' assemblies. We have councils. Just more emphasis needs to be put on those frameworks. At COP, activists have set up a people summit outside and I really hope that leaders pay attention to that. There's also, as Rowan is that right? mentioned, um, power imbalances in activism. So it's a lot easier. Some actions that we can take in the UK would result in murder or imprisonment in other countries. And that's why we really need to stand in solidarity with inactivism. There was a group called WTF, WWF, that did an amazing action where every step of the decision-making process in the action, they Skyped the indigenous communities they were speaking for and asked them what they would like them to do next. And it was a really, really powerful action. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about some solutions. So. Louder. <laughs> um, those in power often focus on funding and technology, which is really useful and important, but it can't be the whole solution. Like electric cars are great, but ultimately you're still extracting resources and harming ecologies and communities. Um, so we can't pretend just because we're funding more renewables that we're not also causing harm in other countries. We can't keep demanding beef and plastics and minerals and resources, and then also just have a climate project on the side and pretend it's all okay. Sustainability needs to be at the core of what we do, not some kind of free gift on the side. And unfortunately, that's not what I'm seeing happen at COP yet. I really hope I'm wrong, and I have not had the time to read the news in depth, but the sponsors of COP have really showed it to me. Like, some of the main sponsors, some of the, some of the sponsors of COP are NatWest and Unilever, who are two of the most polluting companies, and they just happen to have some sustainable projects as well. So COP26 has the potential to do a lot, and I'm trying to stay hopeful. But governments have historically broken a lot of their promises, and I'm a bit dubious, I guess. Mm. And I've, either way, climate change is going to happen. Whether it's less severe or more severe, but it's going to happen. And we need to create our resili resilient communities now. As activists and as individuals, we have a huge power to do this. There already have been attempts to create communi resilient communities with community gardens, mutual aid, the Cambridge Community Kitchen and free shops, um, ways to protect the most vulnerable and try to balance the injustices of climate change. And this can happen as globally as a solidarity and also locally in our community. As Donna Haraway says, who's a feminist scholar, we have to stay with the trouble. We can't pretend there's going to be some massive solution and the world will be fixed. And we also can't think there's going to be an apocalypse and go into despair. We need to stay living with the difficulties that climate change will bring and create resilient, resilient communities through that. Very good. Thank you. Richard. Uh, well, I just uh, would like to add a, a down note on, on this, if, if there's such a thing, uh, which is that I'm part of a, a, a research <coughs> movement 
uh, which uh, is, is called deep adaptation. And it's trying to understand what will happen if Antonio fails. That is, if we continue down the path we're going now, which um, will mean that there's an enormous amount of uh, 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 societal <coughs> upheaval and perhaps disintegration uh, in 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, my particular group is focused on what are going to be the consequences uh, for people who are uh, climate refugees, uh, particularly in the Sahel, uh, which is going to see a displacement of about 25 million people in the, uh, due to uh, desertification in, in the next uh, two decades. And the question is where they'd go. Hopefully, they could stay in their own countries and not be external refugees. Uh, that's probably not going to happen. And that what we're going to see is a massive movement of people from the Sahel into large cities and foreign countries, in, including a movement to uh, Europe. Our best projections at the moment is that we'll get about 10 to 12 million climate refugees in the next two decades. Now, if you recall, uh, maybe too young to recall this, in 2015, a million and a half refugees in Europe ignited a spark on the right, which was appalling. So multiply that by 10. So we're trying to understand what um, this deep adaptation movement, how do we deal with consequences like that so you don't have a complete societal breakdown? And it's a question in Africa, it's a question in Latin America, and looks like it's going to be a, a, a question in, uh, in Asia as well. Uh, some of this research is, um, is ongoing here, and if you're interested in it, in the, uh, from February on, we're going to have a, a seminar here on uh, deep adaptation and strategies of deep adaptation. I hope this is all irrelevant. I hope that Antonio succeeds and that uh, 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 the, the world changes in another way. But if it doesn't, we've got to figure out how we are going to keep a society uh, going as with issues like, like uh, refugees, uh, which we're completely unprepared for. So solve it, do it, <laughs> put us out of business. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Richard. Some, uh, uh, some, some sobering analysis from, uh, uh, from all of you. Um, I, I'm going to uh, encourage a bit of discussion within the panel first before coming to, uh, to questions from the audience. Um, it, perhaps I can ask Rowan to kick things off. What do you want the Secretary General to be doing, <laughs> especially over the next week and a half. <laughs> I'm sure his diary is already fairly full, but part of me says more of the same. Part of me also says, keeping on challenging the idea, and I pick up here from Miriam, challenging the idea that the solutions are always going to be primarily technological rather than socially adaptive and imaginatively adaptive because we are often deluded by the idea that we can dig ourselves out of the hole by the same techniques we've dug ourselves in. Technology is a crucial part of this, but I think it's just a, a sliver. So I wonder what, what can be said from a place like yours, Antonio, about changing mindsets, habits, lifestyle, because that's to ask you to be perhaps as much of a preacher as <laughs> some of the rest of us are. Uh, <clears throat> that leads me to two <laughs> levels of reflection. First, I think 
and I'm probably unfair for some of you, <coughs> that each one of us has not yet fully assumed our individual responsibility in relation to limit our carbon footprint and limit our contribution to climate change. Because obviously, that matters. I mean, and uh, uh, we have seen uh, recently in France, a country that has a meaningful level of uh, conscience in favor of uh, climate when there was an increase in the prices of fuel, which by the way is a obvious instrument to reduce the consumption of fuel, uh, there were the yellow uh, vests. Also because, in my opinion, the French government did it uh, the wrong way, but I mean, just to say that there is still in each one of us a contradiction between what we believe is necessary to do and what we are doing ourselves, which is, uh, at individual level, what I said about the tragedy of the commons at, at, at country level. Then, second point, technology will be extremely important. And I'm hopeful that technology will help us bridge the gaps that uh, probably will be very difficult to, 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 to bridge just by making governments, especially emerging economies, um, uh, do enough to, to reduce their, their emissions. But there is one thing that is very dangerous, and that is the position of um, some politicians um, that say, well, uh, we don't need much of an effort now because new technologies are emerging, uh, the batteries, the, um, the electric cars uh, everywhere, and so this will solve the problem. Yeah. Now, this has two questions. First, we don't know to what extent these new technologies will come sufficiently on time. And then, of course, from a technological development to put it massively working in societies, there is a gap of time. And second, we are already close to some dangerous tipping points which means we have no time to wait for new technologies that will completely change our style of life. We need to reduce emissions now. Um, we are still at 1.2 degrees, so we are close to 1.5, and if we go on increasing emissions in the decade of the 20s, we will make it impossible to reach 1.5. So all your efforts as citizens, all your efforts as uh, activists must be to make all decision makers in the governments, in the public sector, understand that this is a moment in which the extra effort must be made, independently of the fact that I fully uh, subscribe, that we need to invest as much as possible in accelerating the access to new technologies that will allow, because hydrogen, as you know, is a clean fuel. Even if, depends on the way it's produced, but I mean, that's a more complicated story. Um, uh, uh, obviously, uh, electric cars uh, uh, will uh, give a lot of help and many other things. But the question is, we have no time to wait for all that to solve the problem we need to start solving the problem now by putting pressure on government to reduce emissions and by each one of us, and I must confess I'm also a sinner, each one of us um, 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 understanding the need to reduce our own carbon. <coughs> Just very briefly, I, I think you've put your finger on one of the, the real problems here which is that some of the talk about technology is in effect saying, in five years' time, we will have a technological solution to today's problem. But in five years' time, the problem will be different and worse. And that's, that's one of the contradictions which people are not grasping, I think. Um, the, 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 the generation that is going to be 
overwhelmingly affected by all of this. What do you want the Secretary General to be doing? So Antonio just touched on this, but in terms of this new technology, yes, it is the time thing, but also the fact that when you start producing these batteries, then you need to go into extractive mining, and then that causes a whole other host of human rights issues. Um, and it has huge consequences for workers' rights and women's rights within, within global majority countries. Um, but my, what I'd like to see from Antonio and from COP would actually to be to come down really hard on the UK government um, because it's my, <laughs> it's my understanding, and actually somebody come in and correct me if I'm wrong, but the UK government currently doesn't have any commitments to stop new fossil fuel infrastructure. I think I'm right in saying that, but please do correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I think here we have such a responsibility and we're just not quite there yet. But um, my question to Antonio would be, is it right for Mariam and I and all of our peers to be hopeful after COP? Are we, are we right Sorry? to be hopeful after COP? <laughs> yes, <laughs> for two reasons. First, we will make some important progress in the COP in areas that are relevant. It's not the solution of the problem, but areas that are relevant. I'm, we have already seen commitments in relation to deforestation. We have seen commitments in relation to methane. Methane is a gas that uh, will last less time in the atmosphere, but is, uh, uh, has a huge impact uh, immediately in relation to uh, global warming. Um, and there, are, there is an important initiative on this regard. And I hope that it will be possible to agree on two articles that are still missing from the so-called rule book the, of the implementation of the Paris Agreement, one on the establishment of uh, carbon markets and the other on transparency. So if these things happen, um, and a few other initiatives of the same sort happen, Glasgow gave a positive, important contribution. There is one thing Glasgow will not be able to solve. It is the emissions gap. And the emissions gap, uh, largely at the present moment, uh, comes from the fact that a number of emerging economies have not the will or the capacity, or probably a little bit of both, to um, uh, reduce their own level of emissions that is still growing. Uh, and I'm talking about China, I'm talking about India, uh, Indonesia, these kind of countries. And at the same time, Countries that say to the developed countries, uh, we are, we'll be ready to do more, but we need financial support and we need technological support. I mean, it's a complicated discussion. So this Glasgow will not solve. My hope is that in Glasgow we'll establish some mechanisms of cooperation and partnership that will allow to solve it. Because we need to combine the technology and the finance of developed countries with the political will of these emerging economies to be able to accelerate their transition. And if that happens, I think we will be on time to preserve the 1.5. So let's take profit of the things that we will get in COP. And the next day, let's start fighting permanently for the reduction of emissions. And when I say permanently, it's permanently. It's, we cannot wait for more five years for the new national determined contributions. Now it must be every year asking countries to do more because uh, uh, we need to accelerate this effort. Mariam, anything uh, from you? So much that I could say, um, struggle choosing. I guess I would ask then on this thing of ethics of climate change is given that is it maybe a reframing of, of the way we think of climate solutions. Um, like the West has caused so much of historical emissions and we kind of say, we put a lot of uh, emphasis on emerging economies, but a lot of the, I mean, I'm, I'd probably know less than you to be fair, but when I, uh, basically I looked at three really powerful maps 
The first was the classic emissions map, where China goes red and India goes red and the UK is green. And then they accounted for per capita emissions, and the picture looked quite different. And then they accounted for imports and exports, and the UK just went completely red, and countries like China completely changed. The problem is that we're demanding that China produces all these, all these goods and services. So it's actually not entirely their fault. It's actually other countries outsourcing their emissions to other countries. So I would maybe ask, what is our role? What is the role of developed countries, not only to give assistance to other countries to become more sustainable, but also to stop furthering the unsustainable practices? And actually, one, one concept that I came across that I think is a bit idealistic is the idea of degrowth and actually decoupling economic growth in the West to well-being. We have enough yes. money and resources in this country. It's about being happy with that. But I accept that's probably too optimistic. <laughs> well, I think the way markets work, uh, plus uh, some intention, intentional uh, uh, policies adopted, uh, uh, left, let the, the developed world to basically export pollution. So we'll have our uh, industries uh, 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 in areas that are clean and we will import things from dirty industries that move somewhere else. And sometimes move somewhere else with investments owned by developed countries. Um, and so we, we have witnessed in the recent decades a deindustrialization of the Western world, uh, with societies becoming more and more societies of services, and uh, transforming China in the kind of uh, um, factory of the world. No, I mean, uh, this strategy was uh, a strategy that was uh, seen also from the perspective of um, that allows to reduce prices of these goods, uh, and at the same time, it establishes a competition on labor um, and labor costs that, uh, uh, as a consequence, that the share of capital in uh, uh, national income in both developed and developing countries has increased, and the share of labor has decreased. I mean, um, a textile a textile um, uh, worker in the UK competes with a textile worker in China, so, and so it's difficult to see its salary increase. But at the same time, um, the top management of companies, uh, we see now that in China they compete here, there is a competition for attraction, and so the salaries go up, 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 to two levels that are absolutely, I mean, I would say immoral. Uh, so, this was the trend. The problem is that these emerging economies became so big and in some aspects so powerful that they started to be able to compete also at the level of the high technology. And so we have now this complex balance of power in which some people say artificial intelligence, China is already ahead of the United States. I don't, say, I don't know if it's true or not. It's probably not true, but I mean, things are changing very quickly. And uh, these, in my opinion, will, should lead developed countries to understand that they cannot outsource pollution. They need to solve the pollution inside. For instance, uh, you might have heard about rare metals and rare earths that are essential both for the green technologies and the digital technologies. Practically the capacity of production in the developed world, because the mines are uh, complicated and whatever, everything was closed and everything went to uh, China's, uh, the Brazil's, uh, etc. of this world. So I believe that um, this policy of exporting pollution needs to stop and we need to develop the technologies able to produce several things back in the developed countries. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we need to establish forms of cooperation with these emerging economies to allow them to accelerate the uh, transition to a green economy. So there is, I mean, but this ca 
can be done with international cooperation. This will not be done with geopolitical divides that do not allow for international cooperation. And this is another fundamental battle in the few years to come. And just not, not to lose your crucial point, Mariam, about growth. Um, there are centers in this country and universities looking at not only um, models of prosperity without growth, Tim Jackson's work, of course, in the University of Surrey and the Center for Sustainable Prosperity that's come out of that, but also at Leeds, some scenario planning for the city of 40 years down the line, if we take on board the imperatives we've got now. I think more uh, intelligent academic investment in that kind of modeling is going to be a, a key part of this because it does take us a bit beyond the technological fix thing, which I think you're, you're rightly challenging. And if that can be also part of an internationally cooperative approach, particularly to urban rural modeling, to agricultural modeling, that, that has to be part of the solution too. And this has as much to do with the hardware of society as it has to do with the software of society. Mm. And research is as important in the hardware of society as it is important in the software of society. Uh, now, if Richard will uh, uh, forgive me, I'm going to uh, uh, seek some questions from the audience first, and then there are already some questions come in online um, from uh, those who are watching the live stream. So, uh, any questions from the audience? Um, uh, yes, first, and uh, James is about to appear with the microphone. Thank you. And um, if you do feel free to take your mask off. If you take out the mask, we will Thank yeah, you, yeah. understand uh, you better. My name is Madeline Hahn. Um, I'm a first year PhD student here. Uh, but in addition to my PhD, I work with an organization called Deploy US, which works on bipartisan solutions to climate change in the United States. Mm. Um, and the goal is to really involve people from all sides of the political spectrum on the climate, and particularly reaching out to people from backgrounds that are underrepresented in the climate discussion, like the military and business and religious people as well. Um, and we are, we're seeking to find ways for the discussion to bridge these chasmic divides, particularly in US politics, politics, which right now is pretty rancorous at times. So my question is, in that context, what have you, Antonio and, and Rowan, and you as well, given your US background, found to be the most useful to, to work together on a project like climate change while acknowledging that you're not going to be able to resolve a lot of these other serious divides? Mm. Well, if I understand well the US society, which of course is not easy, uh, I think we have had a positive step from a situation in which half of the political spectrum was recognizing the existence of climate change and half of the political spectrum was denying or acting as if they would deny the uh, reality of climate change. Now, I think there is an almost unanimity that there is a problem with climate change, but there are those that believe that to address this problem and a number of structural transformations are needed and this is very much linked to the recent debate on the clean energy um, initiative. And those that say, no, fossil fuels are very important, uh, they are very much linked to our economy, to our power, to our jobs. And so, uh, yes, climate change is important, but uh, we need to go on investing in fossil fuels um, and technology will solve the problem later. Uh, I think it's very important to now give all the arguments and instruments and I mean and, uh, and support the civil society and support um, those areas of the political spectrum and support uh, the cities and uh, the states that are already moving in the right direction to explain that the two objectives are incompatible. You cannot solve the problem of climate change and maintain the addiction to fossil fuels. Of course, fossil fuels will not disappear immediately. Our main priority has been coal, 
and coal is no longer essentially a problem in the United States because it has been decreasing quite substantially. It's essentially today a problem in, in China, in, uh, in India, in Indonesia, and in countries that came later in the process of, of development. But the addiction to oil and gas is huge in the American society, and it's absolutely essential to adopt the measures that the government was preparing. Those measures will not go through, um, uh, uh, but apparently they have an alternative that might solve the problem, and let's hope so. But the, the battle now in the US is not about whether there is or not climate change. The battle is to make people understand that there is a part of the American way of life that needs to be looked at seriously, and that has to do with the fossil fuel addiction. Uh, Richard, do you want to add anything from that? Uh, well, my own suspicion is that the most important groups for mobilizing change in climate change are American churches, because that's where the effective, uh, where the things from the heart um, uh, really touch, uh, touch Americans. I'm rather skeptical that political action is going to uh, have a uh, change in, in mentality of the sort that Rome is talking about. Uh, and this is not particularly original to me. This was Tocqueville's insight into our country nearly 200 years ago, that it's really the voluntary associations, particularly religion, that make the difference in, in changing how Americans feel. That's what I'm doing my PhD on. It's uh, religion and climate change uh -huh. in the US. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, uh, other questions? Um, uh, perhaps uh, down here? Thanks for such a fascinating talk, everyone. Really appreciate it. Um, sort of got two questions here. The first one is, I know you've all spoken a lot about the dangers of relying on like a silver bullet technological solution, but why do the two have to be mutually exclusive? Why can't we focus on investing loads into technologies like artificial, artificial intelligence and also concentrating on diplomacy and that hard work? And secondly, please could you talk a bit about the opportunities for technologies like artificial intelligence? Where do you think they will be most helpful in tackling climate change? fully agree we must do both. No, uh, I think some technologies will be able to um, produce immediate results. Some of them are already producing results. Uh, 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 I believe that, um, I mean, there are a few very important decisions of uh, um, uh, the companies that manufacture cars, as you know. Even the Americans, I think they promised that they would only produce electric cars from 2030 onwards, uh, something of this sort. Uh, uh, we have uh, 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 the, the, the big problem with the renewables uh, is that uh, renewables are not constant. And so grids need to guarantee a baseline. And um, and, and so, uh, 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 an extremely important uh, technical innovation is the possibility to have giant batteries that can accumulate electricity during, for instance, uh, the day and being used during the night when solar cannot produce electricity. One of the arguments that uh, uh, I heard from Modi, uh, Prime Minister Modi, in the discussion is that we need coal to the, to the baseline because with the, uh, uh, with the, the renewables uh, we, we are not able to do so. I think, well, the argument we could discuss, but uh, this is another essential technological invention. I mean, the capacity to use renewable energy even when it cannot be produced. Um, to alleviate. Uh, so I think it's in energy and mobility that we have two very important uh, uh, areas of technological uh, innovation. Uh, 
Then there is a, another essential question uh, in which innovation is very important because uh, people are more slow than expected in relation to changing their uh, um, um, diet, um, uh, diet uh, practices. Um, so there is a lot of uh, investment now to try to find um, vaccines or whatever other products to allow the cows uh, to digest without um, uh, producing methane. <laughs> Whether this will work or not, I don't know. If this works perfectly, then we will have this fantastic thing to be able to eat uh, uh, wonderful uh, filet mignons without uh, creating a problem to the environment. <laughs> because for the present moment, one of the important contributions to climate change is linked to agriculture and it links to um, uh, our consumption of red meat. Um, now, there's a, a question has come in uh, online from Ben Oldham. Is it fair to force developing countries to end deforestation when powerful countries have done it historically? Why do we have the right to judge them now? Ooh. I don't think it's a matter of judgment is the matter of a common interest. Um, the forest is, uh, uh, can be an important source of uh, uh, wealth and uh, uh, can be an important source of um, uh, well-being uh, uh, in, in, in the countries that still have uh, large forests. Um, and what we need is to establish mechanisms of cooperation with those countries in order to make sure that they really benefit from it. Now, some aspects are relatively obvious, which is to organize effective tourism, uh, uh, tourism, uh, um, specialized tourism. That it's an important source of income. Uh, I have to say, it's. Uh, I, I was always extremely impressed by the way Rwanda organizes the visits to the gorillas. Um, <laughs> uh, it, yeah. I mean, it became an extremely profitable activity for Rwanda because it is strictly organized in a way that you, you get there, there, there are areas that are completely isolated, the, the mountains, uh, but they have uh, people working there to avoid also poachers. And uh, you, you come, you pay a lot of money, but uh, they say uh, you want to go far, you want to go, uh, and they guarantee you that you'll spend half an hour with a gorilla family, and then, of course, with a, a guard. And they make an enormous amount of money with that. I mean, so uh, this is just an example, but so we can make forests uh, a source of income, but we can also uh, establish <coughs> mechanisms of compensation. Uh, when uh, that uh, that is necessary, but but the forests became a global public good. But the largest um, um, la I don't say I don't say if you say lungs of the world in in English. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the largest lung is no longer the Amazonia; yeah, is the Congo Basin. Yeah, Congo. And the Congo Basin is essentially intact. Um, there is a commitment now of Indonesia to stop um, destroying forests for what was dramatic in Indonesia and Malaysia was the, the oil, palm oil, um, uh, so the replacement of the forest for palm oil production. There are no commitments in this regard. Um, we have um, in Pakistan with a program of 10 billion trees. We have several others. So that, that are very important. Uh, and uh, uh, we have the forests in the north that we need to preserve. Russia and Canada, for instance, have large uh, uh, forests that probably are more important from the point of, view of sinking CO2 than the tropical forest. And uh, we need to do everything possible to support them, to preserve it. So, I mean, it's, it's not a question of telling them you are not entitled to. It's a question of creating win-win solutions in which they also can benefit. Can I say something quickly on that? Um, from my experience, a lot of the communities around the forests actually want to preserve their forests because they appreciate the need for them. And it's often 
like the, a lot of the deforestation in the Amazon has come from producing beef, which is then exported to Western countries. So again, it's not always what they want to be doing. And if I could just touch briefly on the technology question as well. Um, I think we definitely do need to be doing technologies, but there's just two dangers with it. And the first is that it's used in as excuse, as we've talked out about before. It's like we can do carbon capture and storage, but only if it's viewed as something we need to do as well, not as a, oh, great, we have carbon and capture and storage, so now we can do more emissions. And the other thing is about creating tech that we don't actually need. Like, electric cars are great, but how about no cars or less cars and cycling instead? It's, the problem with technology is, again, if you're pursuing this growth and more extraction and more production, when actually you can just cut that at the base, I think. Um, now, there's a question has, uh, has um, uh, come in from um, uh, Steve, who's uh, Steve Tijoux, um, who's actually a Pembroke alumnus, but is uh, watching online from Sydney in Australia. Uh, and he asks, uh, do the panel think that countries and organizations have an ethical responsibility to not only go net zero, but to start to erase their historic carbon footprints. But that's the idea. I mean, net zero is not the end of the process. It's just one moment because we need to go into a negative uh, uh, emission. It's absolutely essential because uh, um, a lot of CO2 is up there. So net zero is uh, a moment in which we move from negative to positive, or, or positive to negative, I mean, it doesn't matter. But it, it's not, the, it's not the, 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 the point of arrival. We need to go on. Yes. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd echo that very much. Yeah. I think that responding to the climate crisis is not simply a matter of trying to limit damage or solve a problem. It is also a matter of changing a toxic mindset in the long term, which is why net zero is, as, as you say, Antonio, the, the watershed moment, we would hope, for some sort of change. Um, otherwise, it's very easy to imagine getting back on, on the same wheel. And, well, that may happen, but we, I think it's, it's of the greatest importance to think of this as more than just problem solving. Um, a couple more questions from, uh, uh, from uh, the audience. Uh, uh, how about uh, uh, you here? Um, really enjoying the discussion so far. Thank you so much. I was actually quite concerned by a um, slightly offhand comment made by the Secretary General earlier when you were talking about um, rising fuel prices. Um, what? Sorry? Rising fuel prices in France, um, saying that the um, rising fuel prices are a good way of limiting the amount of fuel used by people, which of course I'm not denying, but it seems to me in the same vein that um, higher quality food is more expensive and therefore fewer people consume it, in that it'll ultimately, if this were the case, that the poor and the less advantaged would be the first to suffer and the first to forego privileges that come with being able to access more places by car, for example. So how do we, mit how do we, um, how do we reduce the amount of fuel consumed or resources consumed or clothes bought without ultimately allowing the rich to continue to have their privilege of consuming what they like and doing what they like and without divesting the poor of their opportunity to also live a fulfilling and uh, resource-wise sustainable life. And oh. that doesn't, of course, just apply within a country, but it applies globally between countries as well. But um, uh, uh, well, First of all, subsidies to fossil fuels distort the market and penalize renewable energy. It's very clear. Uh, um, but when I say that we need to re reduce and, is, and, close and uh, uh, finish with uh, subsidies for fossil fuels, I always say that that money needs, because if you, if, if you don't give the subsidies, you spare the money. 
that money should be given back to the society in ways that make people have a uh, behavior in which you have a win-win situation. Because you pay more for gas, but you get that money in your taxes. And because you pay more for gas, you go for an electric car and go on receiving your money from taxes. So, I mean, it's a win-win situation. You will spend less money and you will get more money. So, governments need to be smart in the way they reduce subsidies to fossil fuels or in the way they tax carbon or whatever other mechanism that increases the cost of fossil fuels, but compensates society and probably in a, in a much more fair way uh, 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 with what they get from the reduction of subsidies or from the taxes on carbon. Uh, any, any other comments on this issue of poverty and access? Um, I'd like to thank the audience member for actually asking that question because I think you've highlighted a really important tension in climate change discourse, which is that of, of um, class. Um, and I think this is why so many people champion the Green New Deal. And this will be an important question for the UK as well if we were to close down certain fossil fuel infrastructure, what would happen to those jobs? Um, so this is really close to home. As Chris has said, it, it happens across countries, but also there are real questions here in terms of you know, people who work at Gatwick and Heathrow if, if our flight patterns changed. And that's why the government really would need to think about how we can have that skills transfer for those people in those jobs so they don't lose out when we have that trans transition. And that's why we call it a just transition because nobody misses out. Mm. But obviously I appreciate it. it's easy for me to sit here and say that when there's so many different things to think about. And if I may just an additional comment. Uh, I think the logic that must prevail in the world is that we stop subsidies, subsidizing things and we start subsidizing people. So instead of spending a, 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 an amount of money in subsidizing fossil fuels or other products, you should have, for instance, a minimum income guaranteed for families, um, or you should have a um, reduction in uh, uh, your income tax uh, for salaries, for instance. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, I, and for it, giving an example of fish, 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 fishing communities. I mean, you need to, to put diesel more cheaper for them to be able to fish. But make them buy a more expensive diesel, but give a subsidy to each boat that fishes in a certain circumstance. Yeah. What will happen is that probably the owner of the boat will decide, let me have a better engine that will spend less fuel and I get the money and uh, uh, I spend less than what I was spending, so you will win. I, I think that, that this pinpoints a question which has been behind several of the, the contributions. The issue about climate is actually also an issue about democracy and sustainable democracy. And to go forward without radical change in this area is actually to look towards ultimately, a, a much less democratic and accountable future. So we, I, th I think we just need to keep these connected all the, all the way through in discourse. Uh, now, time is, is racing on. I think we've got time for a couple more questions from the floor. I'll take two questions in succession. Um, first of all, here. I'd like to ask you about uh, in your ideas on the international carbon credit trading, because there are some developed countries aim to make use of the international carbon credit trading to achieve their emission goals. 
and uh, some people criticize that kind of attitude. And they say there are those countries just uh, um, buy the credit abroad and uh, rather than the cut off their emission by their service. So I'd like to ask about your opinion on this kind of a situation. So carbon credit trading and uh, question just in front uh, of you. Um, I think my question was kind of looking at it from a developing country perspective. Um, I know Antonio mentioned something about how there has to be the will from the developing countries to actually take advantage of the financing that's being made available. So I was wondering what your thoughts, on, thoughts were on whether the development priorities will change in time. So for example, I'm from Nigeria and um, mm. climate change isn't, I guess climate change in the sense of reducing carbon emissions isn't necessarily a priority, it's more, um, as you mentioned, an issue of environmental degradation or air pollution or deforestation. So more about like the effects of the climate change. So I was wondering if you thought the development priorities would change in time or if there needs to be a rephrasing of climate change in the sense of, because climate change as climate change is mostly um, seen as a Western issue. Um, but I was wondering if there needs to be a, re a rephrasing of climate change from a government perspective to kind of incorporate it more deeply into um, how development should look like and how development should be driven. Yeah. Mm. Um, it, now, uh, uh, two questions there. Um, Carbon markets um, can be an instrument to reduce emissions, but if they are not properly organized, can be an instrument that allows for increase of emissions. So the question is not yes or no to carbon markets. I think it's a positive thing, but it needs to be properly organized. And if it is properly organized, it can be a mechanism that allows for justification and investments to reduce um, emissions that might be then used to compensate in situations where countries are not able to, um, uh, to reduce as quickly. Now, the flip side is if uh, uh, countries stop the effort to reduce emissions just by buying credits. That is why there is one thing that is very important. The price of carbon needs to be high. With high price of carbon, you have the possibility of making this market a market of reduction of emissions. Now, I, I think I, I, I said that, I mean, if you are from a developing country perspective, you have not only climate change, I mean, you have vaccines, you have uh, 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 lack of support to the recovery, you have... Uh, uh, lots of problems of water, problems of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, extreme poverty in some areas. Anger. So obviously what, what we want is a model and we have worked in the UN to produce that model with the so-called Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. So, so uh, uh, I'm not saying that everything now must be reduced to climate change. No, I mean, we, we need to look into the relations between the developed and developing world in an integrated perspective. But uh, there is one thing that uh, I, I think I heard you say that I would like to tell you that I disagree. Climate change is not a, a question for the developed countries. The responsibility, yes, is with the developed countries, but the impacts and the suffering of people is essential in the developing countries. And I've witnessed the devastation in the Caribbean. I've witnessed the devastation in Mozambique. It's unimaginable. Uh, how all of a sudden a country loses practically everything or a region loses practically everything. Uh, I mean, developed countries are not suffering this systematic impact. So to stop climate change, in itself is much more important today for the developing world than for the developed world. We have in the developed world more capacity to absorb the impacts of climate change than in developing countries. Uh, Richard, do you want to come in on this at all? 
not really. I, 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 I wanted to raise a, to me, a, with you, a practical issue about ethics, which is how can we hold hypocrisy to account in COP26? We're bedeviled by hypocrisy. Is there anything we can do, neither the, this meeting or you, to hold this kind of hypocrisy uh, uh, to account? Well, there are uh, several things that can be done and one that cannot. Yeah. I, mean, I would like to have a system in which there was an independent uh, um, measurement and a system of penalties and incentives. Uh, to a certain extent, that's what, what Biden tried with his... Uh, yes. And, uh, yeah. Now, the Paris Agreement is a voluntary agreement. It's not a treaty. So the commitments made by countries are voluntary commitments. And there is, uh, uh, in the Paris Agreement, a number of uh, norms about how to measure the performance of countries, but they are not perfect. And there, I cannot do much. Uh, what I announced uh, is that I'm going to create a group of experts to measure effectively the commitments to net zero or to reduction of emissions of non-state actors. Because we are seeing lots of companies in the world announcing net zero. No, I mean, uh, according to what uh, was reached in Glasgow, $130 trillion of assets have announced yeah. that they would be but many of these things, in my opinion, are just um, uh, smoke. I mean, yeah. uh, so uh, I think we need, for the private sector uh, and for other uh, actors, uh, we need a system of measurement and evaluation, and that is what I intend to create. I think, but I cannot then put a penalty on the company. But. Uh, uh, I mean, the fact that things become public helps. Um, yes, the transparency would help. Helps. It'll help. Um, the, the mechanisms of the Paris Agreement in relation to transparency are to be discussed now. And one very important contribution of the COP26 would be exactly if we manage to solve the problem of Article 13, that is the article about transparency. Uh, now, a, a, a final question uh, that's come in online from Mercy. How are you planning to engage young people in the post-COP26 future, and particularly young Africans, as COP27 will be in Africa? Egypt. Now, I mean, we, have, uh, uh, we are trying to establish as, as much as possible networks. I have an... Uh, a climate uh, youth advisory board uh, with people from all over the world and indigenous groups, um, um, people of uh, rural communities, people living in towns, um, uh, students, many of them, others already working. So I have this youth advisory board and we are establishing networks. Um, and uh, in the proposal, uh, that we, I have presented now called Our Common Agenda, that you might have heard about it, in which one of the key points is exactly how to take into account the interests of future generations in decision making. Uh, 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 one of the objectives is to create an office, because now we have an envoy, but to create an office to, uh, to be a, a platform of organization of all the mechanisms to reach out more broadly to young people around the world. We need more capacity to do it and we intend to create it because um, the young people has been the best ally in the fight against climate change. A, a very brief footnote to that, picking up something Richard said earlier. I think in Africa especially, um, the role of faith communities is potentially enormous in changing minds, changing the atmosphere. It's one of the problems, we were talking about it earlier over breakfast, one of the problems that there are kinds of religion around at the moment which are actually very destructive to any kind of um, intelligent discourse around climate change. 
But that's not the whole story. And I think there are actors in various faith communities whose role in Africa particularly, where churches, mosques, and so forth are so much the focus of civil society activism in many ways, that's an area to work on, I would say. And I don't just say that out of as a religious self-interest, but agreeing with Richard that there are levers in certain social contexts which really need to be made the most of here to engage people. Now, as a, as a sort of wrapping up exercise, I'm going to ask each of the panelists in turn uh, to sum up, if you can, in a couple of sentences, what you think should emerge from all the discussions at COP over the course of these two weeks. And Richard, I'm going to ask you to go first. Uh, well, I think first this issue of transparency in dealing with hypocrisy is key. Uh, and uh, I hope we can make some progress on that. Um, I think there, that we need to have fallback positions in uh, our thinking about climate change so that it's not a kind of we either succeed or fail. That's hopeless. Uh, this is a, a process. And part of that fallback position is to understand what kind of harms our, your generation in particular is likely to suffer and to, to try and anticipate those. Marianne? I'm going to be quite controversial, so I'm not expecting anything from COP. I'm hoping that activist communities outside COP learn how to organize together and communicate and learn from each other and start to create grassroots solutions. I would love it if politicians at COP listened to them communities and, it gave, and empowered them and actually gave them voices and platforms and the resources. But my focus at the moment is like, okay, governments could do their thing. We're going to actually try also do it and ignore their talk and actually make the solutions happen. I sort of hope you're wrong, but um, <laughs> I can absolutely see where you're going. Um, and Jan. Uh, I do agree with all that has been said on this side so far. I think I'd like to see more explicit naming and shaming of the bad actors that have yeah. caused this situation. And I'd like to see more commitments made by the most hypocritical countries, um, which the UK government, I believe, is one. Rowan? I too doubt very much whether COP is going to deliver a great change of heart. But what it can deliver is both the, the fulfillment of the financial promises made about um, resources for transition for less developed countries, the 100 billion that's somewhere still in the ether, and, as Antonio suggested, a tightening of the timetable on the delivery of such funds, because that's one of the things that slightly breaks down the, the massive, massive imbalance of power and of risk that we're currently facing. Just that small step is something to overcome that, that gap and to facilitate the, the less developed countries in coping with the transition that we're all looking at. Well, the day after the COP, it's necessary, first, not to give up on anything, and second, to intensify all efforts in all areas. And uh, there is one thing that is happening, is independently of the COP, uh, or linked with the COP uh, in an informal way, we are seeing a huge mobilization of capacities and resources in the civil societies, in the business community, in cities, in all those aspects. Now, now we, I believe we have enough money if we are able to put together the government's contributions, the multilateral development banks that need to be an instrument um, of so-called blended finance to bring climate, uh, private finance into the game, because if not, it's not enough. Now, to, to, now it's a matter of building the coalitions that are necessary to make sure that in the next few years we really address seriously the emissions gap. And uh, I think it's possible, but it needs persistence, patience, insistence, naming and shaming sometimes when necessary, uh, but 
organizing, organizing the, the different goodwills that exist or the promises that exist and put them into operational mechanisms to deliver, uh, especially to those countries that are big emitters and need technological and financial support uh, to create the conditions for us to be able to come to 2030 with a guarantee that the temperature will not go above 1.5. But it's work, 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 shout, 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 <laughs> and mobilize, 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 mobilize. And uh, uh, some will be naming and shaming, some will be just mm, building uh, uh, complicated uh, financial uh, uh, mechanisms, some will be doing, um, mobilizing the, the the, the, the families or the, the communities or whatever or to, I mean, it's fighting all fronts, accelerated effort, never give up and get it done. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Antonio. That's a perfect note to end on. Um, and some will actually be trying to steer everyone to collaborate together in order to achieve some of this, and that's you. So thank you very much for um, uh, coming and joining us this morning. <coughs> and thank you to Richard and Mariam and Anjam and uh, uh, Rowan for joining in the discussion. Thank you to the audience online and especially to the audience here in the room. Thank you very much indeed.